46, and we're going to start reading there. We're going to read through to verse number 41. This is a very familiar portion of text for those of you that have been serving the Lord for a while, but nonetheless, this is where the Lord has led me to to preach uh, this morning. This has been something that I have uh, been dealing with within my own self, and one of the things that I have learned through the many years of preaching is that some of the greatest sermons that I've ever preached, some of the sermons that have seemed to have the greatest effect, lasting effect on people, were often messages that were born through my own troubles, my own grief, my own sorrows, my own seasons and valleys. And sometimes when you go through things your own self, it has a way of opening up the opportunity for you to speak from your own heart. And this morning, I, the message that the Lord has given me that I'm going to preach to you is it's not something that I've come this morning to make you shout, uh, to make you happy, to give you goosebumps, anything like that. The message God put in my heart this morning is something that I want to speak right to your inner man, the inner person. I want to talk to you in a way that I believe may actually uh, may, may help you, may remind you of the necessity that God has laid on our heart. Uh, this past week has been a very trying week, and I'll share some of that here maybe in a little bit. Uh, but in, in spite of everything that I have faced, I have a made-up mind this morning that I'm going to continue to press on, and I hope you'll do the very same thing. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verse number 36. It's good to have you sign with us this morning. Thank you for being with us and uh, join and just, just make yourself right at home. Matthew 26, verse 36. If you got it this morning, if you say amen. Those of you at home, I may not be able to hear you, but just pretend you're here. You can say amen, too. Even if we can't hear you say amen, that's all right. I want to say I appreciate Brother Danny for manning the sound booth this morning for us, making it possible for all of you folks that are at home that you can join us in the service. You can comment, whatever, share the video. I also want to say I thank the Lord for my son, Devin, for his faithfulness of being here with us and playing the drums and my daughter-in-law for doing what she's doing and, and my wife of all queen of all queens, and so without her, I don't know where I'd be this morning. You got it? Say amen. All right. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Have you ever been in a place like that before? A lot on your shoulders. Then saith he unto them, talking about his disciples, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. He gave them a directive. Tarry and watch with me. Bible says in verse number 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Verse 40 is where it gets a little concerning. And he cometh unto disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. Now, if you haven't read anything or paid any, any attention to what I've read so far, I want you to look at the next few words that the Lord spoke. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh that rotten, nasty, drag you down, make you mad, make you sad, make you lonely, make you jealous, make you bitter. But the flesh is weak. It was weakness that caused the disciples to be found sleeping. Weakness in their flesh. That when the Lord said, watch and pray, that when He came back, that they weren't watching and praying, they were sleeping. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Ask the Lord to have His will and way one more time. 
Father, I know we've prayed in this service already. But I pray this morning that you will add the anointing that makes preaching edifying. You'll use the Word of God to speak directly to our soul. Lord, let this be a message that doesn't just go right over our heads. A message that is not easily received. But I pray, God, let it find good ground. And I pray, Lord, it will bring forth multiplied plenty for everything that is done. And everyone can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to your soul this morning, your inner spirit man, on the subject of the obstacle of weakness. As many of you that have read the Bible, you've heard a lot of preaching maybe in your time of serving the Lord, you know that our text is found in a time whenever Jesus is soon to bear the sufferings of the cross. Jesus is at a place of his life that he is soon to go and go through the vicarious sufferings, as you've heard it referred to before, and he's going to endure the cross. He knows this. He feels it. He senses it. I can only imagine that like whenever you're outside and you can feel the dampness in the air and you can see the clouds getting dark and you sense that it's about to rain. And the Lord knows that this time is coming. He sees it. He feels it. He knows that he's going to be soon going to that cross. He's got the weight of the entire world and every generation, not just that generation, but every generation past and every generation present and every generation that will be to come. All the weight and responsibility of every soul that will ever live and die is on on his shoulders. This is a difficult time. If you can only imagine what he was going through, I don't even know that any of us could really uh, fully comprehend the tension and, and the responsibility that is pressing down on his shoulders. And in this time, he does everything that he can, even though that he's stressed out and, and, and concerned, if you can put it that way this morning. He takes that immense burden and carries it to a place that we know of as Gethsemane's garden. And it's in that garden that even though that he's stressed with the seriousness of the hour, he is stress this on the disciples, the seriousness of the hour as well. There are times you're going to go through things that you let everybody around you know how serious it is, and you know it's serious, but you cannot convince them and they don't fully get what you're trying to tell them. If you're a parent and you've raised children before, you understand what I mean when you tell them, look, you know, if you get caught drinking and driving, you may get your license taken away. Hey, if if you mess around, you may end up getting an STD or you may get pregnant or, you know, you can tell people certain things and you know and understand the seriousness of it, but yet they are not getting it. And I'm not sure that the disciples fully comprehended. Maybe they didn't sense or they didn't understand, but I believe that the great problem is, is that These disciples have been going city to city. They've been facing a lot of opposition from different sides. They're preaching a gospel. They're walking with a man that is hated by the Jews. And there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot going on and a lot of things that are against these disciples. And I can imagine that as just as it is with me, sometimes you get worn down. You get worn down mentally. You get worn down emotionally. You get worn down physically. And if you can only imagine, it's possibly a late hour and they've been traveling, they're they're on foot and, and they're doing the works of the Lord and they've been spent. They've, they've just about ran the day dry. And they're tired now in their body. They're physically weak, mentally weak. And yet the Lord says, let's go up here. There's a very serious thing that's about to happen. And I want you to watch and I want you to pray. And then the Lord goes out a little bit further and He goes down on His face and He begins to pray to the Father about the things that are to come. And He's grieving and He's under pressure. And yet while He is praying... The disciples are falling asleep. 
when they're supposed to be joining him. You know, sometimes it feels like that, that when you need people the most, you need people to stand by your side instead of them watching and praying for you. They're sleeping. And let me tell you this this morning. You can't always count on somebody else to stand in the steed to pray because there are times that you're going to tell somebody, man, I need prayer. You're going to reach out to somebody. You're going to say, hey, pray for me. And they may say, yes, they'll pray for you. And then they never really do. And so you can't depend on everybody else's prayer to get you through the valleys and the lows and the ebbs and the tides and the seasons. You have to have something within you that says, even when I don't feel it, I've got to pray. Even whenever I feel like I'm weak, I've got to find something within me and get the grit, if you will, to do do what is necessary to see this thing through. And so Jesus is down praying while that they are falling asleep and they end up falling asleep. And two different times we read in the text where that the Lord comes back. And in these two different times, he says basically the same thing to them. He says, watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. He is reminding them, I know that it's difficult, but it's important. I know that it's hard, but it's important. I know you're going through a time where you're weak and you're weary and you're ready to go to sleep, but it is, it is worth it. There's a reason for this. And so after he's done this now twice, and he's reminded them of the seriousness of the hour. He has, he has directed them to watch and pray. He's reminded them that the flesh is weak, but it's worth it anyway. The third time that he comes back from prayer, I can only imagine if he prayed an hour the first time, maybe he prayed an hour both other times. Maybe it's been three hours of praying. And I don't know if you've ever been in a prayer meeting before, but 30 minutes in a prayer meeting for a lot of people seems like a long time. An hour is quite quite a long time for a prayer meeting. After about an hour, you've just about ran out of things to pray for, it seems. I mean, in your human vocabulary. And so you can only imagine, maybe it was two, maybe three hours. I don't know. But these disciples are fighting against their own physical weakness and their own possible emotional weakness. And so the third time that the Lord comes back, He says, go ahead and sleep on. In other words, all the time that we should have been praying, it's already passed we got to get up and go. We're going to go into that trial. Let me tell you this morning, if the Lord shows you that there's something up ahead, the time to prepare is now, not later on. The time to get the fire is now, not later on. The time to get the lamp trimmed and burning is now, not during the middle of the trial, because not everybody makes it through the trial. Can you say amen to that this morning? But Jesus pointed out the fact that even though there are times that we want to do the right thing, our weakness gets in the way and keeps us from doing the right thing. I run into people all the time that I honestly believe they really want to do the right thing. I believe that when you get right down to it, on the inside, they really want to do the right thing, but the weakness of their flesh continually causes them to fall flat on their face. Do you know anybody like that? When you talk to them, it seems like they really want to do right, but for some reason, they're having the worst trouble doing right. Sometimes they can do right for three or four weeks, and then they fall. They do good for two or three days, and then they fall. There are some of you that you have done the very same thing. You You've been good. You've been faithful. You've been, you know, right there doing the Lord's work and His will. Being faithful to the house of God. And then whatever reason, something happens and you fall behind and then you go through this process of feeling guilty within yourself that you let the Lord down. You let everybody else down. And sometimes the devil will get on your shoulder during those times and say, well, why do you even try? You see, you can't live this and you can't do it. And so because of the weakness, you eventually give in and cave in. Many have done that very thing. I want you to know that not everybody that starts out to serve the Lord continues to serve the Lord. There are many people that start in this race and they run for a little while and then they give up the fight because of they, the fact that they go through trials, they get weak, they allow things to happen and there's a process of erosion that takes place in their life. Let me tell you, if I could capture the enthusiasm and the motivation, the excitement 
of newfound salvation and put it in a bottle. Every time that somebody went through a trial, I'd pull that bottle out, I'd uncork the top, and I'd pour it all over you. Because what that, that feeling that you get when you first got saved, man, it'll carry you through any trial. You're like a Marine fresh out of boot camp. You're ready to whip every devil in hell. I don't know, there's just something about the excitement of being saved and sanctified. And when you first get filled with the Holy Ghost, and I mean you just feel so on fire, and you're ready to whip the world. And all of a sudden, you live a little while. You go through stuff a little while. And you come become susceptible to the seasons of weakness. And I want you to know some folks, these are not times that we like to talk about because it happens to all of us and it doesn't sound very spiritual. But as a pastor, I have made it my job to always be transparent with the church, never try to be something that I'm not, never try to mislead people, to set the bar way up here and I can't even live it myself. I believe in being transparent and I want you to know that everybody that is sitting here or or listening online, you are susceptible to the hours and seasons and times of weakness. I don't care how long you've been in this. I don't care how long you've served the Lord. You could have served the Lord all of your life. But a process of erosion can take place. And that excitement and that enthusiasm and that passion that you one time had, it begins to fade. Have you ever been guilty of that? Has it ever happened to you? How does it happen, Pastor? How do we find ourselves one day? We look around. We don't understand why that we don't want to go to church anymore. Or we don't have the motivation. We're not excited to get up and sing that special. We're not excited to get up and sing in the choir anymore. We're not excited about the move of God anymore. We heard that the church is having revival. But I don't get as excited as I used to get. I'm not as enthusiastic about the move of God like I once was. I don't get in the altar and pray until my hands tremble and my tears begin to flow down my face like I once did. What is wrong with me? Well, I want to tell you this morning uh, this that I believe that a part of the reason is it's a failure on our part. Now, we're living in a generation that loves to blame everybody for their problems. Well, it's my forefathers, my parents, my grandparents. Uh, it's him or there, my boss man. Uh, it's my church. Well, I went to this church and they did me wrong. Uh, people don't want to take responsibility for what they have done. If they've committed sin, it's easier to say, well, I got hurt by a church than to say that I sinned and it was my fault. It's easier to say that, you know, my boss did me wrong and, and he wasn't treating me fairly than it is to say that I was a pretty sorry employee. We're living in a generation like that. But I want you to know if we're going to, we're going to get anywhere with God, we have got to be honest and upfront with God. And the truth is, it is a failure on our part. When we become weak, it's not because of God, because God is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. It doesn't matter if it's a pandemic or a Pentecost. It doesn't matter if it's a problem or it's a time of a Pentecost, a Holy Ghost outbreak. Whatever we go through, if we become weak, we may be a product of everything going on, but that is our fault. If I allow myself to get weak, it is not my wife's fault. It is not their fault. It is my fault. Somebody say, God, help me. God, help me. If you're a pastor, if you're a preacher, if you're a singer, if you're a leader, especially God, help me. I can never encourage somebody else until I'm first encouraged. I cannot preach a gospel that I have not lived by myself and fairly do it. Can you say amen, somebody? You see, Paul alluded to this problem because I believe that when we fail to stir that cauldron of spiritual necessity in our daily lives, we become weak. And Paul alluded to this when he exhorted young preacher Timothy. Timothy was about to embark on a on a, a work for the Lord, being a pastor, being a leader, amen, being a guide, if you will. And so when he talks to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 1 and 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God that is in thee 
by the putting on of my hands. Uh, think about what he said there. He said, Timothy, stir up that thing that is in you. When I laid hands on you and brought you into the ministry, when I laid hands on you and ordained you, there was something that got inside of you. And son, you've got to stir that up. Uh, do you know uh, that when something is not stirred, uh, I've preached about this, I've brought in illustrations before to illustrate the fact. But if you take something like hot sauce, amen, and you leave it on a shelf and you don't shake it for a while. If you watch, after a period of time, you'll see water gather on the top. Am I right, anybody? The reason is, uh, is when you don't shake it and when you don't stir up the contents, uh, everything begins to settle to the bottom. Uh, and our failure is uh, we're not stirring up the gift of God inside of us. Uh, and the contents of the great ingredients uh, of power, amen, of living right for God, it's all beginning to settle like sediment to the bottom of our lives and all that's left is a watery experience on the top can somebody say oh woe is me God help me this morning you see when it's not continually stirred that spiritual valuable part of our life it settles to the bottom like sediment but I believe God's able to help the church to overcome but we've got to want to get there we can't allow ourselves to become weak and anemic in the Lord I began to, my mind began to race when the Lord laid this on my heart. And you're going to understand better before I'm done the reason why that I say that this message was born out of my own problems and pain. But I began to think back to a story that a former pastor that I sat under had told and shared about his family that had gone on a vacation to the snowy mountains. And uh, he began to show us through this story that he told something that I believe is relevant to this message even right here this morning. But he began to tell us that every single night that they were in the snow-capped mountains up north, he said during this vacation that every family member had a position and every night they would take turns and it was a different person's job to get up during the night and put more wood on the fire in the fireplace. They were in a big, nice, beautiful log cabin, a retreat, if you will, for vacation. And so every night, and so uh, for the first couple of nights, it was somebody else's job to get up during the night and go stoke the fire, go poke and stir up the embers of the fire and to put more wood onto that fire. But he said that it came his turn to, to stir the fire and to put wood on the fire. So all night long, uh, it was his responsibility to make sure that everybody else in the house had warmth and heat and that they could all be comfortable during the night because it was freezing temperatures outside. Here they are in a log cabin without central AC. The only heat would come right from that fireplace inside of that little retreat that they were in and he said so for the first little bit he fell asleep and he woke up and he realized he needed to put more wood on the fire so he got up he said wipe the sleep from his eyes he went down to the place from the upper loft got down amen went down there to where the fireplace was he said he began to put fire on there stirring up the embers uh, or put wood on the fire and then he went back to bed well a little while later went by and he said he remembered in the night that he began to get a little colder. He said he began to feel his feet getting a little colder. And he said he woke up and he thought to himself, it's probably about the time that I need to go put some wood on the fire. I probably ought to get out of bed and go stir up the embers and put more wood on the fire. But instead, he said he laid there a little bit longer. Have you ever done that and overslept and was late to work? And so he laid there a little bit longer, Sister Misty. And after a little while, sleep took over and he quickly fell back to sleep. Uh, never did he get up and go put wood on the fire. They woke up the next morning everybody in the house was freezing cold. Uh, it was like below zero in the house uh, and everybody was upset with him uh, because now it will take hours uh, to get the warmth back in the house because the, the cold has overtaken the whole house. Uh, one person was responsible all night long for making sure that they kept the fire going. Listen, you got lost people in your family. Some of you got husbands and wives that you're responsible for. And you're the one that's got to get up and stir the fire. Amen. We're in a 
a time right now that we have to understand that we can't always rely on the pastor to get up and stoke the fire. We can't always allow, hey, remember, rely on a bishop or a pope or a rabbi or somebody else to stoke or stir a fire. We've got to be the one to get up during the middle of the night and go and put wood on that fire. It is our job to do that. Listen, there are people at home right now. Hey, Amen. You may not be able to be in church because of everything going on around us. We are living in an unprecedented time. And it's time that the church and everybody in it understands that if you don't put wood on that fire and if you don't get up in the middle of the night and stir up the embers, everybody in that whole house is going to suffer because of you. Listen, if you're a preacher and you're listening online this morning, let me, let me admonish you to know this. Just like Jesus said to the disciples, uh, amen. You may be able to understand uh, that the spirit is willing, uh, but the flesh is weak. Uh, sometimes that flesh man can get weak, uh, but sometimes you got to put a, pull up your pant leg uh, and pick up one foot at a time. Pick up, pull up, pull up one more foot. Sometimes you got to roll up your sleeves uh, and get back in the fight when you've been beat up. Uh, you may be weak, but it ain't time to let go. You may be weak, but you cannot let go of the plow. This morning you You've got to serve the Lord in spite of your weakness. Say amen, somebody. I want you to know this morning that everyone in that house, every single person in that house, amen, had suffered because of what that man decided not to do. What happened that night with that pastor is a stark contrast to our necessity to maintain the fire in our own lives and the repercussions when we fail it affects not just us, but everybody. I have to take my responsibility as a pastor very serious, and I do. And sometimes it really wears on me. I told my wife the other day, I said, I mentioned this earlier, I think. I said I would give almost anything that I, I was a full-time pastor in the sense that I was able to collect a salary like all these other pastors that that I know I don't have to go out and work in a hundred and some degree weather inside buildings with no ventilation, no no open window sometimes or doors, maybe one door open and it's a hundred and some degrees and you're pouring sweat and I've already got other health and other issues and I by the time I get off work, my mind is so bombarded with that. And uh, during the day, I may have 15 or 20 different emails and text messages with job estimates and invoices and people wanting something, this person needing that. And by the time I get home, I'm so spent that it's almost like I got nothing left in my bottle to give, not my family or anybody else. And I'm like, Lord, I, I just don't know. I don't understand. But see, at the same time, I cannot use that as an excuse to just let go of the plan and say Lord I can't do this as brother Richardson reminded me yesterday in encouragement he said brother you got to remember that the Lord ain't going to put anything on you that you cannot bear he knew when he selected you hey, man, he knew when he anointed and appointed you that you could handle it or he never gave you that position or that job let me tell you sometimes we think and I'm not talking about because of something in me because of something he put in me not because of my flesh not because where I was raised not because of my background my my family or anything else. Matter of fact, I wasn't raised in church, folk. Hey Amen. I cut my teeth at a late age on the pew. Let me tell you something about God. But God was good enough to raise me up and appoint and anoint me for the work of God. And now here you are in the fight. And many around us are falling victim to weakness. We got people falling through the cracks. Why, Pastor? Because there are people that don't have the tenacity and the motivation to maintain their walk can I talk to you and make it real listen I alluded to this a couple times in the last few weeks but there are people that they rely solely on one service or two services in a week to get them through the whole week they're used to having church like that they get all their motivation from somebody else if it was not for the pastor reading his text on, on any given service, they don't read the Bible at all. Anytime they need a, a blessing or a breakthrough or a word, they don't have the, the wherewithal, the motivation to get down and pray for a word themselves. 
Those are the kind of people that are falling through the cracks right now. Because the church, in many cases, we shut down for three weeks here recently. This is our first service back. And there's still some that are not able to be here. But you know what I'm telling you is this. It's during the process, during this sifting that's been going on, people are falling through the cracks. They're falling by the wayside. Why is that, Pastor? It's because of weakness. Why are they weak? Because they're not maintaining the fire at home. They don't got the motivation to get up and grab a Bible and read it. Let me tell you, if you don't got the victory, it ain't because of your pastor. It ain't because of the church secretary. It ain't because of somebody else. It's because of you. Amen. It is your job to maintain that fire, somebody. So, well, we can't be in church right now, pastor. Well, baby, let me tell you, you better find you some preaching online. Said, I've been real low lately. Well, stop listening to some of the garbage you're listening to on the internet, the TV, amen, radio. Get you on some good gospel music. Amen. Get on, get tuned into something like, let it rain, let it rain. Let me tell you, sometimes you got to break off the chains by listening to the songs about listening about sounds breaking off the chains. And if you don't do that, you may be the next one to fall by the wayside to weakness. I'm just telling you this morning that there are people that don't have that motivation. I'm not saying that to condemn anybody. As a matter of fact, the church was commended. The church was, the church was exhorted to bear them that are weak. Amen. To encourage them that are weak. There are people at home when they're not being called to the altar. They don't pray anywhere else. Now, if they were in church and people were looking at them and people were watching them, they're praising the Lord. There's a certain sense of accountability. But when you're at home and there's nobody around and you're not praising the Lord like you do in church, what's wrong with being at home or riding down the road by yourself listening? Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And just throwing up your hand and began to praise the Lord. Just like you would in church. Honey, let me tell you, you got to maintain you. Yeah, you say, Pastor, I'm feeling low. And I didn't get last week's message because of whatever. Honey, find a preacher that you can know is anointed. Tune in. Get, get, get to some preacher. Listen to something to upbuild and uplift you. Because if you don't, that enemy of weakness is going to creep in. And the next thing you know, you'll find yourself so lethargic. You barely can pull yourself together to pray. Amen. Somebody say amen. I want to tell you, the great, one of the greatest dangers of the Christian life is when we pass through a season where accountability and responsibility are not holding our feet to the fire. And that's where we are with a lot of people right now. There are many re- people right now that because of this virus, there are people that are not praying because they're not in church and nobody's watching them. There are people right now, preachers and teachers, that are not giving themselves the preparation and study because services have been canceled, classrooms have been canceled, choirs have been canceled. They're not doing anything. Do you know that I found out for myself active ministry for the people who are in ministry, active ministry helps keep you on fire. Active ministry helps to keep you as a minister, a teacher, or a leader on fire. But what do you do when a church goes through a time like we're going through uncertainty and we don't know how and what to do and we're trying to navigate the best of our ability? How, how do you do that? You see, you don't just sit down and do nothing. But that's what's easy to do. It is in the sitting down and doing nothing that lethargy creeps in. Apathy creeps in. And you find yourself so weak that the next thing you know, you'll start doing things you never thought you'd do. Say amen, somebody. The falling away because the lack of self-discipline to watch the services online and get it for themselves when they're not in church. That's what's happening. There are people right now, as of right now, they may have watched one, some none, we got live stream services that have been going on. Every time we haven't had in-person services, some people never watch it. And they wonder why they're weak. There are people that don't have that self-discipline. 
that whenever somebody ain't telling them, hey, you, you ain't read your Bible in about three days. You need to read your Bible. There's not enough self-discipline to do that. I'm going to tell you that catches up with you. Pastor, how do you know? I'm about to tell you. I'm going to tell you the lack of revivals and special services that have inst- instigated lukewarmness in the church. We are not able to have revivals like we one time did. Man, you're talking about a Pentecostal. I'm Pentecostal to the core. I think every hair in the ones that fell out are Pentecostal. I love to pray. I love to lay hands on people. I love to shout, run, rejoice. I mean, I'm telling you, I love to throw down Holy Ghost Church. Yeah, how about you? I mean, I cut my teeth when I came into the church. That's the way we was having church. You'd get, have people singing in the choir. They'd get halfway through a song. They would break out, wow, and do the war holler. They'd run around the church, and the power of God moving, people getting baptized, slain in the spirit. I love to have church like that, but you know what happens when you go through a mess like we're going through right now? Everything's like throwing a deck of cards up in the air, and everything's, uh, we don't know it. We don't understand what's going on. We can't hardly pray with people like we used to and yet people say well why can't we? And yet on the other hand I just told you about another church where a associate pastor just died that I know about. Let me tell you something. I don't understand all that's going on but I do know this. In the midst of all of it I can't afford to allow all of that to get me sidelined to not maintain my own walk with God in the midst of it all. Lest I become weak. But these lack of revivals have made it difficult. I messaged one person the other day and I said, please keep me in prayer. I've been really going through something. I've been really going through a time. I said, I don't know if I've, I don't remember a time I felt this week. It's been really difficult. And I said, please keep me in prayer. I said, if there was a revival somewhere that I knew of, now I'm not just talking about any revival. I mean, when you've been in ministry a long time, all this uh, half-hearted church stuff that some people call church, I can't get with it. It just doesn't do nothing for me. But I'm talking about a, a real powerful revival where the Holy Ghost is moving, the anointing is there. I said, I don't even know where I would go. And besides that, I've been working so many hours lately. I said, and by the time I get home, I'm so spent. My daughter-in-law works with me. She knows by the time we get home, it's rough. I don't just work in no, and I'm not throwing off on nobody does office job, but I ain't doing no office job sitting in the air conditioning all day. I'm working in some brutal heat, doing physical labor. And one day I did almost 3,000 feet of, or 2,800 feet of ceiling grid in just one day. That, no telling how many hundreds of pieces of ceiling grid I had to cut. I'm talking about a hard day. And then on top of that, by the time you get home, you're just so spent, you just want to go to bed. I said, I don't even know where I would go to revival, and let alone, I don't even know how I would have time. I said, but please pray for me. I said, please pray for me. Why? Well, I told you this message is kind of born out of my own trouble. And I've always told the church, I do my best to be transparent with you. I'm not going to try to be something I'm not. But I get a lot of strength just from fulfilling my calling. I get a lot of strength just from coming together with the saints. There's something about being with the church that gives me as a pastor strength. I've adapted to that. I have had to learn how to get my strength whenever I'm not being preached to all the time and I'm doing all the preaching. But everything's been thrown up in the air. Everything seems to be changing. This job I've been on has been rough. And so... I found myself not maintaining that fire like I should. And this past week, I had my own meltdown. I had my own breakdown. This ain't spiritual. I know it ain't. But if I don't tell you the truth, I might as well find another thing to get into. But I had my own meltdown. I had a day where I got so aggravated and so mad, I lost my temper. And after it was all over with, I'm telling you, I felt about that big. But you know what God does? He allows those moments like that to check you. That moment when that telemarketer who's trying to put food on the table couldn't find any other job. And she gets screamed at and chewed out by somebody supposed to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And you talk to her like a piece of trash on the bottom of the shoe. And then you get off the phone and you're like, where did that come from? Let me tell you this. Sometimes God allows those little moments like that to check you. 
so that you'll wake up and realize you're not spiritually strong where you thought that you were, that you may think that you are. You are not exactly where you need to be. Sometimes God does that because there are a lot of times that there are parts of our life that we're not revealing to everybody else. And so you're not going to have some, somebody that's got enough confidence come by and say, man, you sure don't act like you've been in the past. You sure act like something wrong with you. There's some people that don't want to hurt your feelings to come around and say, boy, you sure have been a jerk. Am I telling the truth? There's not too many people that come around and say, man, I've been noticing. I've been listening to you talk for a while now, and I've been noticing you've been fibbing a little bit. You know what that is? That's called lying. It's stretching the truth. I don't, whatever you want to call it. So I've noticed you've, you've been letting up a little bit. Something's happening to you. This is what is happening to a lot of people. And the other day I told my wife, we were sitting at a little auto parts store, and I told her, I said, I didn't bother you all day long. She was at work. I didn't want to put all that on her. I've been having all this stress and everything on me, trying to know the right thing to do about church and everything else and all this. And I told her, I said, I had a meltdown today. And I said, you know, maybe I'm just not cut out to pastor during a time like this. I said, you know, I just don't feel worthy. I said, I'm going to have to find somebody to preach for me Sunday. I said, because I, I don't even deserve to be in the pulpit. I said, the honest goodness, it's just, it's, I said, and I told her, I said, it's my fault. I said, ain't nobody else's fault. It's my fault. Get off work. I'm hot and tired and dirty. I'm working all this time. I don't want to be bothered. I'm agitated by everything going on. I told some of the men today I bought another truck and a transmission's gone out. Now it looks like the rear end's gone out and every kind of other problem. I just got another truck and I got all these problems and everything weighing down and I've just, I got weak. I allow myself to get there. And I sat there and I thought to myself, I'm not the only one that's going through this right now. There's a lot of people that is dealing with the same thing. Right now, there are pastors across America that they don't know whether they're going to be able to even keep the doors of the church open because the attendance has been up and down and so low because of everything going on that the finances are not there and they can't even pay the bills. There are mothers and fathers right now that don't even know whether or not they feel comfortable or safe to go to church because of everything that is going on. And so they are kind of in between whether do I go to church and take a chance and, well, I just heard about this the other day. I don't know what to do. And you know what's happening? A lot of people right now, because of a lack of discipline, are getting weak in the faith. They're not reading the Bible at home. They're not tuning into the church services. Uh, hey, man, I'm no crazy dummy. I wasn't born yesterday. I know that we got people that will tune in the broadcast and watch about five minutes of it turn it off and turn on Oprah or something else because they just won't. And I'm not saying everybody does that, but I'm telling you, I'm not crazy. I didn't fall off the boat yesterday. I'm going to tell you that some people will do stuff like that because, they went, well, I just want Pastor to know that I did watch two and a half point three minutes of, of that sermon that he played the other day. If I ask you, what did I preach about? They wouldn't have a clue. And the reason is because they don't have the self-motivation. If you think that you can survive without eating, uh, you're wrong. You've got to feed the soul. God did not give us pastors uh, and churches and leaders to feed the flock of God uh, for us to sit home and starve to death. Every time that broadcast comes on, I don't care if you can't be in church. That's fine. I understand. You got to do what you got to do. But honey, every chance you get, you better be feeding your soul because one day you'll be like Pastor Myers and you'll wake up and realize, man, why am I so weak? i tell you why. Because you don't read, you don't pray, you don't got a prayer life, you don't study the Word of God like you used to, you don't call out to God. God, when's the last time you even fasted? Oh, this ain't popular. Somebody say help Pastor Myers. The sad thing, people are becoming weak and susceptible to backsliding and offense. Weakness is like that inner man beginning to pine away in your inner strength. Your ability to say no when you're tempted. Your ability to keep it together whenever you're tested. You're pining away on the inside. You're getting weak. The sad thing is that it's common for it to go undetected until something happens to reveal to us just how weak it has become. Some of us may be weak and not even realize it. 
Some of you may be more weak than you even know. When our enthusiasm and our passion to read His Word and pray is gone, it's a sign that something is wrong. I told you at the beginning of this message, and I, I stand by this still, if I could take all that excitement and enthusiasm when you first got saved and put it in a bottle, I'd pour it on you every time you got weak. The truth is, you serve the Lord a little while, you're going to go through the hills and the valleys. You're going to go through the storms and the trials and the upsets. And in those weak seasons, you are susceptible to weakness and offense. What do you mean by offense? Doing something that you never would have done. How can I tell when I'm getting weak? When you start allowing things you would never have allowed before. When you start saying things maybe you would have never said before. When you start acting in ways you'd have probably never acted before. And I'm not talking about good ways either. When you're willing to watch things on TV you'd have never watched before. Listen to stuff you'd have never listened to before. You're getting weak. When, you're, when you allow yourself to engage in conversations with people around the break room, you'd have never listened to that foolish trash before. You're getting weak. Because a strong man will not keep himself in an environment that he has a choice in. He will remove himself because he has a banner to uphold. He has a standard that he has committed himself to. But I can tell you this morning that there are other ways we can know that we're getting weak when we begin to replace spiritual outlets. That's very easy for people to do right now. When we replace spiritual outlets like church ministry, involvement with spiritual things such as this, with carnal entertainments and fruitless endeavors, you'll find yourself weak. And you say, Lord, what am I going to do? I don't. There are some people that when they hit that crossroad, when it's revealed to them that they are weak, they don't have to make a public announcement. They don't have to call the church or make a Facebook post. Now, I've met a few that do that sort of thing. I'm, I'm done. No, you know what usually happens whenever a person gives up? They don't say a thing. They just stole, slowly start to regress, and they slowly start to slip back into their old ways. You find yourself screaming your head off like a crazy person at your husband or your wife or somebody, you lose it, let me tell you something. You need to get on your knees and pray because what has happened to you, you become weak. I'm not telling you we don't get frustrated and angry and that sort of thing. I'm just telling you that when weakness comes, you are susceptible to offense and injury. And I'm not just talking about your injury. I'm talking about the injury of other people, the people you hurt, the people that you let down. I hold my responsibility to pastor the church so high that when I, met, when I failed myself, whenever I let down my guard, I told my wife, I said, you know, those people in that church deserve a better pastor. That's what I said. That's what I said. My wife said, honey, we have been through stuff before. We have faced different things. You're just going to have to pull it together and you have to do what you got to do. Now listen, we know we need to pray. We know we need to read the Word of God. We know that we need to involve ourselves in spiritual things. But even still, I want to tell you, and I, I believe there was a reason why the Lord allowed me to go through this so that I could share it and maybe help somebody else. I got down and I tried to pray after I had allowed myself to get so weak. I got down and I began to pray, and I mean to tell you, it felt like I was praying to the drywall. I mean, it really did. I felt so empty and so dry and so disconnected, and I'm praying. And it was like, anybody ever get down to pray? Some of you are going to say it happens to me every time. But anybody ever get down to pray, it's just like you can't find the words to even say. You feel like you just say the same three or four things, and you're just like your mind's drifting off. And I thought to myself, I, I got up out of bed the other night and I went in the other room Sister Myers is already asleep 
And I got down at the chair, and I began to pray a little while. My mind would drift off, and I here I am. I'm just being real with y'all. But my mind began to drift off, and I'm thinking about this and thinking about that, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm supposed to be praying. So I try to pull myself back into prayer, and I made it up in my mind until I actually get to the point where I can feel that flow of God's Spirit in me. I'm not getting up. I have to think about macaroni dinner and fried chicken, and I have to think about what i got to do for work tomorrow and then pray two minutes and then think about some other problem. I am going to keep pressing through this because I know the cost if I don't. What are you telling me? I'm telling you that when you finally make up your mind to get yourself out of that weak mud hole that you're in, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Because after you've allowed that house to get so cold, you remember the pastor I told you about when you've allowed the environment to get so cold, sometimes it takes a long time to get things back where they need to be. And you got to be, you got to be along for the ride. You got to have a made up mind. And if you're dependent on a pastor to bring it to you or some preacher to shovel it out and give it to you, you may be in sad shape. I believe that during the sifting right now that we're going through, that the strong are going to survive. The people that have got a made up mind are going to survive. But my heart breaks for the weak because I know what it feels like to get weak. And it was a wake up call for me. And I said, God, if myself, I have served the Lord for many years, I've got a made up mind to serve the Lord. And if somebody like me can get loose and, and, and begin to let things fall and let things go and allow myself to get in a place where I feel weak. Amen. Woe is to all the people who have only been serving the Lord for a little while and our families who we were trying to get in church and these that may have just got saved not long ago. My God, help those people because they need motivation. I'm going to tell you, mamas and daddies, I'm nearing the closing if you're wondering. Mamas, daddies, listen to me. Grandparents, you have a reason, and it's not just you to keep the fire burning. There are eyes watching you. There are people that are looking at you, and it, you have to maintain that fire because what happens uh, is when you begin to ride that roller coaster of spiritual ups and downs, uh, you're serving the Lord with all your heart today and maybe not next week. Those little eyes and those people watching you, they think that that's how you serve the Lord. And if they ever do try to serve the Lord, they'll be up and down most times. Why? Because you set the pattern for them. I'm not telling you that life don't get rough and sometimes we got to pray through. What I'm telling you is that when you realize you're not on fire, there's work to do. You're going to have to get busy. You are going to have to get busy. If you got to go home and turn the TV off and turn on some spiritual music, if you got to go home and take that Bible off the shelf and actually read it, if you got to find a subject to start studying about, start studying it. When is the last time some of God's people actually started studying something about the Word? It's a wake up call. And some people may wonder, what is the big deal, Brother Myers, about being weak? The problem is, 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 when we become weak, weakness often leads to sin. The reason people do some of the things, the reason that some of the Christian people that you have known that fell, some that have fallen hard, is because they got weak. I'm smart enough to know that when I begin to sense that weakness, I can't just lay there. I have got to get up, and I have got to do something about it. Weakness leads to a spiritual regression. You're going backwards instead of forward. I want to close with this and remind you, there has to be a resolve within you. You have to make it up in your mind. If I've got to get down on my face with nobody else around me and turn my stupid cell phone off, if I'm not ever told you anything, I'm telling you that, Brother Myers, the first thing that I grab when I get up out of bed, I unplug my cell phone and pick it up to see who's emailed me, who's texted me, or whatever. If I cannot take five minutes when I'm spending more time on my cell phone than I am having any conversation with God at all, or I can sit around and watch something or listen to something that has no fruitfulness to it at all spiritually and spend no time, and then all of a sudden whenever a problem arises and my wife's had a bad day and she says something to me and I get mad and, what do you mean by that? 
Well, par- part of the problem is, is that I haven't really prayed through all day. What about you? That's just me. What about you? I'm going to tell you this morning, it's time for us to get serious. In all that I have preached to you, I believe that with everything going on, this is one of the worst years I have ever seen, biggest mess I've ever seen. I've never seen a country with so many different, there's so much division and so much hurt and so much pain and so much sorrow and so much foolishness and death. And I mean, uh, it's everywhere you look. This has, been a, this has been a terrible year. But I can tell you this. God is still just as good as he's ever been. And in the midst of it, he needs a church. And he needs people who know how to survive when the going gets tough. They said, well, I've, all I've ever known was Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek. Three times a week, that's all I've ever known, Pastor. So uh, that's how I survive. I survive three nights, three services a week. That's how I survive. Well, we're going through a time right now that there are people that, that they ain't going to make it because they don't do nothing outside of church. They ain't going to make it. But I'm trying to help you. We just stand to your feet all across the house this morning. The obstacles, the weakness. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano this morning. I want to tell you that this message, like I said earlier, it was born through my own pain and my own problems. I don't know when the last time I felt so defeated as I did this past week. So beat down, so broken, so distraught. If you've ever in your life as you serve the Lord and you read, and I'm talking about people that really love the Lord, if you ever felt like you let God down, I don't know if there's any more gut-wrenching feeling than to feel like you've let God down. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning, whether you want to pray at your pew or whatever you want to do, but I'm going to encourage you to find a place and seize the moment of conviction and let God speak to your heart. If you get down and find a place and you pray right now, and you say, Lord, I need you to help me with some areas of my life. I want you to take, take for consideration some of the things. Maybe you begin to slip some things that have slipped right through your fingers. Are you guilty of some of the things that I talk about this morning? You really don't have much of a prayer life. You don't, you don't feel like that you have renounced God, but you just you don't really have much of a relationship. 